And uh, yeah, let's get started right away. So we're very excited to have Anna Draber. Um, Anna is a Johann Bjorkman Professor of Economics at the Stockholm School of Economics. Her research includes meta-science and behavioral and ex experimental economics. She was a fellow and a research associate at the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. She's an associate editor of the Journal of Political Economy and Management Science. And she's conducted high impact work on predicting whether published social science findings will replicate. And I believe she'll be talking about some of that work today. So whenever you're ready, Anna. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, super fun to be here. Um, I was saying earlier that I was actually a bit nervous for this talk because it's a different crowd audience that I'm used to. So the prediction part will probably be super boring for you or not boring, hopefully, but uh, maybe obvious and you will see that there, are, there is room for improvement and maybe that's a good thing. So we can talk about what we've done. Uh, we're using predictions in a very specific context and then uh, think about how to improve this and uh, yeah that would be great uh, okay so i will talk about predicting replication outcomes um okay the, so the so we're basically thinking more generally in meta science and other fields of course uh, which results can we trust and we know we have to talk about p-values and statistical power uh, we care a lot about p-values in most of the quantitative social sciences where I'm working in. So I work a lot in economics and psychology, but also some other fields. We talk less about power, unfortunately, but we know it matters somewhat. Uh, but we, uh, at least in experiments, uh, traditionally in economics have not considered power uh, that much, which is, which is a problem. We know that we should care about publication bias. Uh, how, what's the share of false positive results in literature? That's going to depend on the degree of publication bias we have in the field. There's a very nice paper by Frank Gotthard published a few years ago in Science, and you can see the figure here on your right, um, where they follow the fate of 221 social science experiments and basically find uh, that no results are very unlikely to even be written up, uh, whereas positive results, uh, strong results, meaning statistically significant results, are of course very likely to be published and rarely remain in the filing drawer. And then we know that it's not enough to sort of look at the p-value. You also have to care about where the p-value comes from if you're doing this, live in this null hypothesis testing world, where, which I live in, for better or for worse. Um, we have to care about whether the p-value is there from a fishing expedition, uh, which makes it completely meaningless, uh, from p-hacking or from forking, which also makes it impossible to interpret the p-value. So it's not just enough that you have a low p-value. So all of this is maybe obvious for this crowd, but when I talk to economists and psychologists, it's good to point this out uh, repeatedly, and then we will discuss this more, but not in this talk. Um, and of course, we should also care about the prior for the hypothesis that is being tested. So what's the probability that the hypothesis is true in the first place? This is not something we typically incorporate much in economics, behavioral economics, um, social psychology, and related fields. And why? For various number of reasons, obviously, um, including the types of statistical tests that we do but also because priors are typically subjective uh, and hard to access. So whose prior should we be incorporating when we assess some initial results on some interesting hypothesis? Um, and then we're arguing that maybe prediction markets can help us uh, get to these priors in the domain of uh, replications, for example. OK, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of replication and prediction projects. And uh, I mean, the focus is on the prediction side, but in order for you to know what we're trying to predict, I will introduce the replication projects as well. So this will consist of sort of old work and some newer work. So I'll talk very briefly about these big replication projects in psychology, experimental economics, a project we had on nature and science, social science replications, and then how we have uh, added prediction markets and surveys to assess peer beliefs about replication outcomes. So these projects as well as to a couple of the many labs projects. And I'll explain what these are. Uh, we are doing increasingly uh, many projects where we are not using prediction markets, but are trying to forecast or predict replication outcomes from forecasting surveys, where we have different types of incentives. And I'll add maybe an fMRI project if there's time. So I, I don't have much time, and I want to save room for questions. I would be fairly fast, but if you want papers or references or anything, just send me an email, and we can set up a meeting and talk more. 
I haven't met most of my co-authors, uh, including someone like Yining Chen that I think most of you know, and we have tons of papers, so we don't need to meet and we can still collaborate, so that would be great. Okay, all of this is joint work with lots of people. So the one person who is constant in all of these projects is Magnus Johannesson, who's a colleague here at SSC. So I'm actually in the office. Uh, things are fairly normal here uh, in Sweden. I've been throughout. I've had Corona and hope, hoping not to get it again. Okay. Um, so what do we do? So we do these replications, uh, replication projects. And here's like the first point in the presentation where you might start to get annoyed. So how do we define replication outcomes? So I mean, it's, we're trying to be in the world mainly of direct replications, meaning that we take a study and we try to redo the study as similar as possible to the original study. So we try to get the original material and everything from the original authors and then to, we try to redo the study in, uh, with a different subject pool. To the extent we can, we try to keep the subject pool as constant as possible. So in one of the projects, we had three original studies run at the Harvard lab. Then we ran the three replication studies at the Harvard lab. And that's not something we can always do. So there's this uh, blurry line between direct replication and conceptual replication, where in a conceptual replication, we would uh, explicitly vary something and see to what extent does this matter for the generalizability of the original results. And as I said, it's not always clear that we are always in the world of direct replication when we want to be there. So keep that in mind. Okay, so we take this one original study, we try to redo the study in a new and larger sample. And then we say that a result successfully replicates if we find the effect in the same direction as the original result. And this new result is statistically significant in a two-sided. So here's where many people start being uncomfortable, saying we take this uh, continuous variable and make it binary. And yes, that's mainly what we do, for better and for worse. And I think for better in the sense that we're trying to ask people to predict the outcome of this, whether we find an effect in the same direction that is statistically significant or not. And in the past, I think people have had an easier time thinking about that rather than relative effect sizes, for example. So I think people are thinking more about effect sizes in general, and that's a good thing. And then they will also be better at predicting relative effect sizes. And I'll tell you something about the correlations between these measures as we go along. Okay, so I played a completely minor role in this big uh, uh, reproducibility project in psychology, where we were 270 authors led by Brian Osek and his team uh, that replicated 100, project, 100 papers from uh, three top psych journals published in 2008. I think many of you know it if you're interested in uh, replications. Um, but the outcome was that for the 97 results, they were positive, meaning statistically significant uh, in the, among the original studies. Only 35 were positive among the replications and statistically significant. So in the left figure, you have the p-values for the 100 original studies. And you can see that something magical is definitely happening at at the 0.05 limit, and then you see the p-values for the 100 replications, and nothing magical is happening uh, among, uh, in, in, that, in those studies. So very inspired by that project, we decided to do something similar for experimental economics. So we looked through two of our top journals and searched for all experimental papers testing a main effect. So we, didn't, we excluded interactions, unlike in the psychology project. And that's important to keep in mind because interaction effects were found to be less likely to replicate. And then we wanted to, what we thought then was to have high power in the sense that we have 90% power to detect 100% of the original effect size. This sounds good if you don't think that the original effect size is inflated, of course. And then we see what we find and I could discuss these studies more, but I would basically just say that 11 out of 18 studies replicate when we again say that a study replicates if we find an effect in the same direction as the original result uh, that is statistically significant. Uh, in the third project, we looked at papers in nature and science. So we went through all papers published between the time period 2010 and 2015 and searched for between and within subject designs, testing clear hypothesis, and using students or other accessible subject pools. So for example, we didn't include a study looking at deception among bankers, because given their p-value of 0.047, I think, we would have needed thousands of bankers <laughs> to replicate that study. And unfortunately, we don't have access to so many bankers. Um, in the big uh, psychology project, the last study in a particular 
paper was typically chosen for replication. That was criticized. In this project, we took the first study in each paper and chose that for replication. That was also criticized. So in our latest project, we're randomly picking a study uh, to replicate within a paper. And that's also being criticized. So this is sort of, I guess, what we have to deal with. Um, in terms of power, we here had a way higher power. So we did a two-stage replication procedure where we, in the first stage, had 90% 90, 90 power to detect 75% of the original effect size. If the study did not replicate then, according to this binary criterion, we did a second round of replication so that we, in the pooled sample, have 90% power to detect 75% of the original, 50% uh, of the original effect size. So this leads to sample sizes that are about four times as big as if we were going for 90% power to detect 100% of the original effect size. And this is sort of see, okay, even for true effects, how exaggerated are they uh, compared to the true effect size? And we look at a bunch of other replication criteria here. We talk a lot about relative effect sizes, and we look at the base factor, uh, prediction intervals, uh, small telescopes approach, uh, uh, some Bayesian regressions that E.J. Wagenmarcus did, and other things. So what do we find here? We can look at the stage two results to your right. So we have these 21 studies from Nature and Science. Um, in blue, we have successfully replicated according to this uh, binary criterion. And in yellow, we have failed replications. So when we have the most data in stage two, the highest power in our test, we, we find that 13 out of 21 studies replicate. So not super bad and not super good. Um, and when it comes to relative effect sizes, we find that for the 13 studies that replicate, relative effect sizes are about 75%. Whereas for those that do not replicate, according to the binary criterion, relative effect sizes are about 0%. So sort of if you don't like the binary criterion, they, it does coincide pretty well with relative effect size, the relative effect size measure uh, here. So okay, so that's sort of the background. And then to these projects, we've added prediction markets. So, this is one of the few crowds I go to where I don't have to introduce prediction markets. <laughs> so that's good. So this, our project was basically, basically super inspired by Robin Hansen's 95 paper. So my co-author Thomas Pfeiffer read this uh, years ago and started talking about this. And we said like, yeah, it would be awesome to have prediction markets on scientific outcomes. And then we met Yiling Chen, well, I never actually physically met her or in real life. We started collaborating and thinking, yes, let's add prediction markets uh, to replications. So in 2012, we contacted Brian Osek and his team and asked, can we add prediction markets uh, to the big uh, replication project in psychology? And he and the rest of the team said yes. So uh, since then, we've run a number of uh, prediction market projects. So we ran it for a subset of the psychology studies. We, we ran it for all of the all of the 18 uh, studies in experimental economics. We ran it for the nature science replications, for uh, the many labs two and many labs five studies. So these many lab studies are big replication projects in psychology, where you don't just replicate the study once in a lab. You take some results and you replicate it in 30 labs at the same time. So power is a lot higher, and you can explore some interest whether there is heterogeneity in results in labs, depending on the time of the semester or where in the world, world the lab is, et cetera. So super interesting projects, I think. And we have many other projects, including with Jun Tao, who's here, uh, we added prediction markets to the DARPA score project. And the results remain to be shown to the world, so not today. Um, so in these prediction markets, we give participants money between 1,500 US dollars. Is that a lot of money? Of course, it's not for a PhD student. It probably feels some whether you get the money or not, and whether you get more. But it's mainly there to sort of give some type of fun carrots to a project that people are probably participating in because they think it's mainly fun. Um, we invite them to participate in these markets for between 10 days and two weeks. And then, of course, they get this one central hypothesis for each study that we're replicating. I mean, that's the main result that we're replicating. And then they can bet on the outcome of, of this uh, uh, replication. So they're trading contracts with binary outcomes, where a contract will be worth $1 or 50 cents, depending on the setup, if the study is replicated according to the binary criterion, and otherwise it's worth $0. So we interpret the price here as the probability that the market assigns 
the event. So the probability that the market decides that the study will replicate. We use Hansen's logarithmic scoring rule. Uh, and we have, of course, both long and short selling. And we give the participants in these markets a lot of information. We think, I mean, they get the original paper, um, all of the paper, also the summary of the main results, uh, including the p-value and the sample size of the original study. Then we give them these three-page reports where we say how our replication differs from the original study. And then they can do whatever they want with this and just focus on the original result or also look at our replication reports. And then we start prices at 50 and see where they go. So before participants enter the markets, we ask them in a pre-market survey, how likely do you think it is that this hypothesis will be replicated? And basically, how well do you know the topic? And who are the participants in these markets? Researchers in psychology, economics, and maybe some others. But those would be the two big uh, groups that participate in these markets. So what do we find? So here I pulled the uh, five prediction market studies that we have done. So we, I mean, I typically would talk a lot about the importance of power because I, I, I'm not a Bayesian, unfortunately. But now I'm giving you 105 uh, prediction market studies. So we're not talking about a large sample here. Um, or actually 104. Uh, oh, it should be 123, sorry. This is work in progress. We haven't uh, published this. So that's why I made a mistake here. So we have these 123 studies that we have the replication outcome for, and we have prediction markets and we have survey prices. So we have uh, uh, successful replications in, in black solid dots, and we have failed replications according to this binary criterion in these unfilled or unsolid uh, dots. So in the simplest type of analysis we do, we say that if the price is above 50, this means that the market thinks that the study will replicate. And same thing for the belief survey. So with this type of analysis, we find a 72% correct prediction rate for the markets and a 64% correct prediction rate for the service. Is this, how good is this? It's not, it's better than randomness. It's not super good, but this suggests some type of uh, wisdom of crowds. And here should be maybe considered that there is quite some variation in how much power we had in the replications. And one could argue that the prediction market should perform better the higher the power in the replications, of course. And if we look at our the, the replication project we ran, where we had the highest uh, power in the replications, that's for the nature and science uh, project. And if we zoom in here, we have successful replication outcomes in blue and failed replications in yellow. And then we have these 21 studies that we replicated ordered according to their prediction market price. And we again draw this line at 50. And diamonds here are market beliefs and circles are survey beliefs. And you can see that all blue diamonds are to the right of all yellow diamonds. Uh, so there seems to be something sort of systematic about these original results and that people are pretty good at picking this up in the markets, uh, but not perfectly. So um, here's a slide I thought you might be interested in that I will spend just uh, very little time on. And this is pre prepared now for a paper with Brian Osek and others, where we compare the prediction market results with what has been done uh, using machine learning models. So there's a paper by Altmaid et al, where I played a minor role, where we had machine learning models um, trained on the, some of this replication data. And then we did an out of sample prediction for the nature and science replication project. We have a successful replication throughout in these solid black dots. Uh, Yang et al. also used the machine learning models, uh, including, I think, some text analysis uh, and looked at citations and other interesting things, and also tried to sort of uh, predict whether studies replicated. And there's another paper by Pavel and Hell that did the same thing. And basically, these model, models perform as well or worse than the prediction markets. They do not perform better. So that's interesting too, and maybe this would change uh, with more data, but here's something uh, to look at if you're interested. Okay, so what have we learned from these studies? Um, things like uh, original studies, even for true positives, uh, will be overestimated in these original, among these original results. Uh, so meta-analysis will, of course, have problems. Um, there's also something systematic about the results that fail to replicate, uh, and that tells us something for the replication crisis that I think is useful. And then, of course, we can ask ourselves questions like, why are so many false results published in literature? 
that's not a question I can ask uh, answer. And what about incentives for replications? Are they appropriate? I don't think so, but maybe we're getting there. And um, mainly so in psychology and less so in economics, I think. Uh, so we're doing other types of forecasting studies too. I mean, we're continuing with prediction markets, um, but we're also doing this uh, sort of longer surveys where we're asking researchers to really get into the details of a study that we're planning to do, testing new uh, hypotheses or replicating studies. And we're giving them basically all the material of the study that we're planning. So they get to know the sample size, how we will test things, uh, all the materials and really go through it in detail. So this is something that takes many hours. We've done this in a couple of recent uh, publications. So in one of them, I will zoom in on one of them, which is this Landy et al paper led by Justin Landy and Eric Ullmann, where they basically look at five hypotheses, ask other researchers to design experiment testing these five hypotheses in any way they want. Uh, with the caveat that they all these experiments should be run online. Then we give all this material to a bunch of forecasters who are basically self-selected researchers who want to be part of this. And we ask them to go through all the material and tell us what is the probability that there will be a statistically significant result, so p less than 0.5. So we ask them to predict this binary variable for better and for worse. And we also ask them to predict the standardized effect size with direction, of course. And then we ask them other things like, do the materials provide an adequate test of the original hypothesis or not? Which is, of course, is, uh, is also important to know. Um, so what do we find? I'm just zooming in on one of these five hypotheses from this land data paper. And I mean, first, not even considering the, the predictions, for a given hypothesis in this case, you can see that you can get a lot of variation in results. So here, all these different teams of uh, researchers in social psychology have been given the same hypothesis, non-directional, and asked, they're asked to design um, a study testing this hypothesis. And some design a study and find a positive statistically significant effect, and others find a negative statistically significant effect. Most of the results actually replicate, because then sort of these conceptual replications are all directly replicated. Uh, and what's, which is the true, which is sort of the best test of the hypothesis, I don't know, but there is tons of variation. And typically, we would just see one of these uh, results. And when we ask people or researchers whether they can predict this, they are pretty good at predicting this. And we don't find any systematic under or overestimation. So that's also interesting, uh, we think. OK, uh, I have another three, four minutes, so I will continue. So we added prediction markets to another fairly recent project. And this is a so-called many analysts project. Um, where we are give, we gave the same data to a bunch of different research teams. So the idea here was very much inspired by a paper by Silberson et al, where they gave the same soccer data to a bunch of different teams and asked them to test whether more dark-skinned players were more likely to get red cards in soccer games. Here, um, we give the same fMRI data where we, I mean, our collaborators at Tel Aviv University, they scanned 108 participants in the fMRI performing uh, two different versions of a mixed gambles task. So this is new economics for you. Uh, we gave this data. So this is high power data for uh, neuroscience. So we gave this data to 70 different uh, independent analysis teams. And we asked them to test nine directional hypotheses. And these hypotheses were based on basically previous literature. And then we just asked them to report back to us whether they find a statistically significant result in line with this hypothesis or not. And they can use their own criteria to determine uh, whether this is the case. I mean, they can set up the analysis any way they want. So in order to see sort of whether these results would be predicted or not, we set up two sets of prediction markets for this, where we ask participants to predict the fraction of statistically significant results for the nine hypothesis. And uh, we did one market with uh, neuroscientists who are not analysts, uh, some economists as well, but people who did not participate in the project. And then we ran one set of prediction markets on analysts. So those that participated in the project and of course had some outcome here. So they had some information about the data, but they didn't know what others were doing. And we gave them some money and we have the markets open for 10 days. So what do we find? Well, here are the nine hypotheses. I'm not a neuroscientist, so this, this do not say much to me, but 
sounds interesting with the amygdala involved. What do we actually find? We have this nine directional hypothesis, and then we have the fraction of teams reporting a statistically significant result. I mean, if there was complete agreement, we would get the close to zero or to one. And you see that for four of these hypotheses, uh, hypothesis number five, seven, eight, and nine, there is quite some agreement, agreement uh, among participants. And then for the other hypothesis, we're basically somewhere in between complete disagreement and complete, complete agreement and complete chaos in terms of uh, what the results are for this hypothesis. Um, and when we ask participants to predict this in, mar in these markets, the share of results uh, that would be statistically significant, people are in general very over-optimistic and the markets are not performing good at all. So the fundamental value is uh, sort of uh, the true uh, result. And then in blue, we have what team members were betting. And then in green, we have the non-team members. So they perform extremely poorly here uh, and underappreciate the amount of uh, variation. So the markets did not perform well in predicting outcomes here. So the thing we're working on right now, and I, we would have run this if it hadn't been due to COVID. So many of us have had projects affected by the pandemic. So we're going to look at decision markets. There are tons of replications to be done. Which one should we do? Now we're going to have let the markets help us decide which to run. So we, we picked out 40 plus papers from PNES published during the time period 2015 to 18. These are all MTurk experiments testing some hypothesis testing a hypothesis. And in many of these papers, they're testing many hypotheses, and then we're randomly uh, picking which one, which study we are replicating. And instead of replicating all of these 40 plus studies, we're gonna use a decision rule where we give extra weight to studies that are, very, that are less likely or more likely to replicate. So we're picking the, the I think it's 14 studies that are the least likely to replicate according to the prediction markets, the 14 studies that are the, that are the most likely to replicate according to the markets, and then a couple of random uh, studies. So that incentive compatibility is there and uh, people have uh, yeah, incentives to truthfully reveal their um, beliefs in these markets. And we were supposed to have opened the, these markets last spring and then the, would, we would have done replications, but as soon as the US has a vaccine, been vaccinated enough, we can run this. Uh, so that's the next project. So um, a question that we have now, so what do we do with all of this? Uh, very unclear. I mean, I think my focus has shifted from maybe thinking the prediction markets were fun to really think more about the replications. And how do we do more replications? And how do we do less of them? Uh, how can we get <laughs> things to change without doing so many replications? Because it's time consuming and it's unclear exactly how much we learn from just one more application. So ideally it should be more massive. I'm a big fan of pre-analysis plans. I think multiverse analysis should be used when you can't have a pre-analysis plan. I'm one of the few who think that P less than 0.005 is a good idea and I'm sure most would disagree. Um, yeah, so those are basically my thoughts. So let's open up for comments um, questions. So there, if you have anything you don't want to say now but you want to send later, just send me an email. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, we already have one question. Um, for others, feel free to, to pop something in the Q&A. Um, OK, so why do we do, so in the, these decision markets, why do we do the most, the studies that are the, likely, the most likely or least likely to replicate? So we want to sort of do, so we think that that's a good proof of concept to whether these decision markets would work well in this setting. So if if we're sort of good at picking out the least likely and the less, and most likely, and then we get the replication outcomes, we can say something about whether this work works or not. And then we could expand this in a new project and, and use some other decision rule, like uh, picking prices that are closest to 50, so we maximize the information value from the replication or something. But in order to sort of show that these markets work, uh, I think that type of decision rule makes sense. What do you think? I don't know if you want to say what you think about it. Or anyone else? Yeah, Grant, feel free to post in the chat if you have some thoughts. I guess one, one question that might be on folks' minds is what, it seemed that there were some commonalities 
among studies that did not replicate are are there any obvious qualities that um, come to mind so so i think when pooling all this replication data from all these different projects i think that's going to show to some extent the return of the p value in the sense that original p value is a very good predictor of uh, whether the study replicates uh, sample size, original sample size as well. And then sort of, if you were to go through some of these hypotheses and look at how surprising does the result sound, I think that can take you pretty far. Uh, so, I mean, that's the reason to incorporate priors. Now we should sort of think about how do we do this? And maybe prediction markets can function as a way to get to these priors. And I think they can. Um, but how do we improve the market so that the pro these are sort of the correct priors? I don't know. Jacob asked an interesting question in the chat. Um, do yeah. you have thoughts about how in the utopian future scientists, grant makers, PIs, or others might integrate prediction markets in their workflow? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So I think journals should be more willing to experiment here. I mean, I think what's, we all like the review process Love is maybe a strong word, but um, we, it's better than the alternative. But what's the problem with the review process? I would say it's this. I mean, one of the problems is the small sample. So two, three, four, five reviewers, that's not a lot. <laughs> so um, of course, there would be tons of just uh, variation in opinions and is often taste-based and not really based on um, sort of the actual, how solid the, the paper is, et cetera. So why not have a one track in the review stage, which is the prediction market prices? Like pre have prediction markets on, on these studies, whether sort of they believe the results will replicate and then credibly have some type of replication. So you say that, yeah, in our journal, we will replicate every 10 papers or so. And so we learn that outcome, but we, and the editor can use prediction market prices as one of uh, five reviewers or something and then depending if I, I mean if i'm the editor i would place a lot of weight on uh, prediction market beliefs maybe more than some from reviewers and um, so I, i'm not at management science anymore but um, we did talk to the then editor of management science and try to have him implement this but it didn't work and i've harassed not harassed is the wrong word i should be like using these terms um, uh, I've uh, like talked to other editors too, and nobody has uh, agreed. But I think someone else could probably convince someone to do it. I think that would be wonderful. Um, and then, yes, well, perhaps the ones with the most uncertainty. Uh, but so we want to say sort of whether the decision markets work. And then I think um, we we have to start with these low and high prices to say that yes, the markets were good at picking out those with low. Uh, probabilities of replicating, they were also less likely to replicate. I'm thinking that that's why we have to do this, these uh, uh, low and high prices. I mean, I, we should talk more about this, maybe think about this. And then could a machine learning model like GP3, I have no idea what this is, because I, I know extremely little about machine learning. Maybe. I mean, the data is out there, so you can take the data and use it and try to predict replication outcomes. And we're doing more replications, so you can have this out of sample prediction too. Um, then would only publish the ones with high prediction market prices or would you publish all of it, but also include the prices? Yeah, so I haven't thought super carefully about this as you realize. Um, I guess it depends on what, what does the journal want? I mean, is it about publishing reliable results? I don't think that's all journals care about obviously, but maybe they, if, if it's sort of a, super low probability result that two other reviewers like, maybe you should cons like consider not publishing that if you're the editor and um, think that it sounds super speculative. But I mean, that depends, I guess, on the editors prior too. Yeah, so not sure exactly, but it, why not have that as an additional thing to help you guide what, it, what you should be publishing? Uh, we have not used previous Bayesian truth theorem uh, but we're thinking about it. I mean, so in the DARPA score project, and Jun Tao can tell you more about it, uh, but the surrogate scoring rule developed by Yiling and others, but not the Bayesian truths here. And then I see another question over here, Pavel. Yeah. What makes the prediction market especially germane here relative to other dissertation methods? Yeah, I mean, 
I think it's somewhat sort of historical chance that made us use prediction market, focus on prediction markets and not other tools. So we've thought about using like service uh, with the Delphi method and other things and see whether that works. I mean, I think the markets could perform better than the service here for many reasons, including that in the markets you get feedback about other people's beliefs. Um, and there's something at stake, but we could also have incentives in our service, uh, which we do have. So we, I mean, I know lots of your work, uh, Pavel, so we are talking about these things and we are going for uh, survey questions in many instances. Okay, I've talked too much. Thanks so much for all these comments. Yeah, thanks so much, Anna. That was an impressive number of questions fielded. Uh, <laughs> thanks again.